You're on mute, Your Honor. I, yeah, I just figured it out. <laughs> you are up, Ms. Sims. May it please the court, Chelsea Sims representing the state of Florida in this case. Um, I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal, please. Sure. Thank you. Today, the state appeals an order suppressing picture and video evidence found on the defendant's cell phone, which shows the defendant sexually assaulting his unconscious ex-wife. The order is reviewed by this court under a mixed standard, with this court giving deference to the trial court's factual findings, but independently reviewing de novo the application of those facts to the law and any legal conclusions reached by the trial court. In this case, because the private doc private search doctrine applies to Deputy Ferguson's confirmatory search of the cell phone, and because the scope of her search did not violate Jacobson's virtual certainty requirement, there's no Fourth Amendment violation here, so the trial court suppression should be reversed. Um, I want to start by addressing the defense's position that the private search doctrine should not apply to the search of the cell phone. Contrary to what defense has argued in their brief, courts have not refused to apply this doctrine to the search of electronic devices. Quite frankly, the opposite is true. Um, in both cases cited by the council, by the, the defense, cases talk about special heightened protection for homes, for example, uh, heightened Fourth Amendment protection for homes. And cases yeah. have also analogized a cell phone to the privacy sanctity of a home. Um, so given that being the situation here, that there's a heightened sort of requirement for this, shouldn't this be more carefully scrutinized than the typical private search type argument? Um, yes, Your Honor. And while cases have analogized cell phones to searches of homes, such as Riley, um, there have been no cases that have ruled that a heightened, that cell phones reaches such a heightened sense of scrutiny that search warrant exceptions or exceptions such as this don't apply. And in fact, in the 11th Circuit, um, U.S. v. Sparks has actually already applied the private search doctrine to the search of cell phones. In the 6th Circuit, Lichtenberger, when addressing this, um, the issue of applying private search doctrine to electronic devices, they refused to um, exempt laptops in the same way that houses are exempt or homes are exempt. So while we can look with more scrutiny, there's nothing to suggest that cell phones cannot, this doctrine cannot apply to cell phones or should not apply to cell phones. We also have the accurate. additional problem here is this wasn't the victim's cell phone, right? Correct, Your Honor, but um, I don't actually believe that that is a problem here. Under the private search doctrine, that really is what happens with private search doctrine is that it's a third party that has this item and searches this item privately and brings it to law enforcement or brings something to law enforcement's attention. So there really are no circumstances under a private search doctor analysis where the item um, analyzed is the defendant's and the defendant brings it to law enforcement. So that third party search is a component of private search doctrine that's necessary actually. You've also read your opponent's brief and they've talked in great detail um, about the additional things that the police found when they looked at the cell phone versus, uh, I mean, look, looked at the cell phone with the warrant versus what they saw when they looked, you know, um, right after the victim brought it to them. And, and, and there were additional things um, that were found. Isn't that right? Um, if you're referring to the file information, so the date stamp of the file and the um, length of the video, is that what you're referring to? I mean, I mean, the date of the video and all that is certainly probative, right? It corroborates the timing of the event and things like that. Um, while the date and the timestamp are additional information in a sense, the victim knew when the date or knew when this video was taken. She told police it happened last night. I had pictures and videos of it. Um, and that really gives no additional information for the actual offense. It may give more detail as to the actual timestamp, but there's nothing, it reveals no more information than the victim already knew about the files. And, um, in Lichtenberger, in Sparks, all of these cases that came out post Riley talk about how the, um, the scope of these searches are individual containers or individual files as opposed to the entire um, cell phone being a container. And so obviously that's a more narrow scope of 
the um, virtual certainty and the scope of the search. But in this case, each individual file being its own container was breached. The first picture was breached when the victim looked at it. And so any information in the file at that point in time is fair game for law enforcement. So just the additional information, the additional details of the timestamp wouldn't exceed the scope of the search in this case, of the private search. Um, and additionally, there's no information in the record as to who actually obtained those timestamps. Um, that timestamp information comes from the warrant affidavit and the warrant affidavit was not challenged below. The only thing challenged below was this search by Deputy Ferguson. And there's nothing in the record. There's no facts in the record. There was nothing developed below as to who found the timestamp, who found that information. And the defense, respectfully, they didn't challenge that. They didn't bring it up. It wasn't before the trial court. So the state wasn't able to develop that information. Okay. Let's talk about the preservation of your independent source argument. Was that preserved yes, below? It was not, Your Honor. Um, okay. So you're abandoning that argument? Not necessarily abandoning that argument because there was no, there was no challenge to the warrant. And so it, it is our position that this first search was permissible. It wasn't an unreasonable search. And so the warrant itself was not, unre was not um, for the poisonous tree. But even if it was, that warrant can stand by itself. Um, so we're not, we're not necessarily okay. waiving it, but. Okay. You've also not. made the argument that it was a shared phone and because it was a shared phone that the victim had, had permission to use the phone and then could give consent to law enforcement to search it, right? Um, the state did make that argument below, yes, Your Honor, but seeing as we are on appeal and the trial court made factual findings that the victim did not have consent to search the Facebook and search okay. the gallery, so we're referring to the court's factual yeah, findings. Yeah, but that's a, that's, a, that's a different question, whether she had consent to do those things versus whether she had pretty much free access to this phone, correct? You know, correct. And, 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 and certainly that and certainly that issue goes to the defendant's expectation of privacy in the phone. And yes and no, Your Honor. Um, the state raised two arguments below. First, the state argued that because the, or the victim had consent and had free reign of the phone, she could consent to the law enforcement search. The second argument they raised was that the private search doctrine applies here. And the private search doctrine, as opposed to a third party search, has no consent component. Um, yeah, in but, itself, you know, like actually, if you look at the, if you look at, take an analogy of a house, a house owned by him. Okay, but there's a, there's, you know, so he, he's the, the person who's on the, le or on, uh, on the mortgage, he's the person on the title. Uh, but, you know, she's there, she's a roommate, whatever, but she has free run of the house. The question is, is does she then have, does he have an expectation that um, she would allow officers to come in the house and, and look around? You know, um, that's kind of the same situ you know, analogous situation here. It depends on the facts of the case. And I would suggest that it's analogous to the first argument raised by the state, but not the second because the second argument raised by the state, this private search doctrine, there is no consent component whatsoever. In fact, most cases, there is no consent. It's yeah, a cell phone. We're not phone talking about consent. Walmart. We're talking about what his expectations were in terms of uh, what, what he reasonably could expect. Um, he could know. have a reasonable expectation of privacy in his home, but if she breaches that reasonable expectation of privacy and frustrates it, then you have a third party, um, sorry, not third party, you have a private search doctrine issue. Once she's frustrated that reasonable expectation of privacy, then he no longer has that reasonable expectation of privacy if she reports something to law enforcement. Um, it's reasonable until it's frustrated by another party. And once it's frustrated, such as in this case, or say she went into his bedroom and frustrated his reasonable expectation of privacy there, that that expectation is frustrated. And that's what the private search doctrine talks about. Um, once that expectation is frustrated, it can then be, the search can then be replicated by law enforcement. And that's what we did here. Or that's what happened in this case. Does that answer your question, Your Honor? Sure. No? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, yeah. 
I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, we, the state isn't arguing that first argument made by the state. We're not on appeal. The, the argument that we're not pursuing is that she could consent to the officer searching. Um, we, we are going to defer to the court's factual findings there. She couldn't consent to it, but she didn't have to be able to consent to it. She didn't have to have the right to go into the cell phone. She did it. She frustrated that expectation of privacy and the private search doctrine explicitly allows court to replicate or the government to replicate a search once that expectation of privacy is frustrated. Um, so there have been cases that have discussed this private search doctrine and the applicability to electronic devices and specifically to cell phones. And this case is very analogous in most ways to USB Sparks out of the 11th. And in Sparks, what happened was the private party located the cell phone, found cell phone at Walmart, um, I believe it was Walmart, searched through the phone, found pictures and videos of um, illicit activities. The private citizen searched all the pictures, like looked at all the pictures in one video in the file and turned it over to law enforcement who then replicated the search of those pictures in that first video, but also searched a second video um, that the private citizen had not opened. And so the fact that the evidentiary hearing came out that the search was replicated up until that second video. And then that second video exceeded the scope. What the court did in the 11th circuit was they found that based on the private search doctrine, all those files that were frustrated by the private citizen, all the pictures in that first video, those were, those were fine. That was a permissible search under the private search doctrine. And those were admissible. The only file that was a problem was that extra file that the private citizen had only seen the thumbnail, had not seen the video. And that, that one file had to be suppressed but the rest of the evidence was permissible at trial. And that's what we have so here Ms. in Sim, our case. So Ms. Sim, so, so to the extent that the information obtained, the additional information, the IME and the date stamp information, to the extent that's what we would um, call exceeded the scope of the initial private search, then that would be subject to suppression? Um, I don't believe so, Your Honor, because that information was actually, um, as to the timestamp and the date, that information was part of the file that was already frustrated. Um, the IMEI number is just an identifier for the phone to obtain a warrant. Um, there's no, no indication in the record whatsoever that Deputy Ferguson was the person who took the IMEI number, but likely either if she took it, it was for purposes of identification for impound or um, and the alternative deputy detective Legas would have taken it to obtain the search warrant. That information, that IMEI number, is simply an identifier to make sure that the correct phone is searched or impounded. So that information is really irrelevant to the offense at hand. Um, even if that information was excised, you have the defendant's confession to the victim. You have the victim saying it was his cell phone. So that IMEI number if it was suppressed as outside the scope, doesn't change the offense or the evidence towards the offense. Um, as to the timestamps in the video or the timestamps and the date, arguably that information could be suppressed, but it was part of the file that was frustrated. So because that individual file, that individual container was already frustrated, that- um, But that, but, but I guess- and. and I, I understand it's it, what what you're saying. It's really not the IME and the date stamp really aren't important because you have that additional information. But isn't the importance of that that if whatever that information was was not transmitted to the deputy at the time of the initial search by the private by the private search, then shouldn't we protect that information and not have that? Um, evidence come in, I mean, no matter what it is, because if it exceeds the scope of the initial search, um, isn't that what we're trying to protect is, is that the, the things that were not disclosed to the deputy at that first time? Um, so are you talking about allowing in the actual photo and video? Yeah, I'm saying, yeah, I, I know you're you're saying that it's really not that important, 
that 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 information, even if it's disclosed or if it comes in, if it's not suppressed, that because of the type of information it is, it's really not important, even if it comes in. But I guess from our perspective, no matter what it is, if it exceeds the scope, it should be subject to suppression as long as it exceeds the scope, because that's the test. Do you see my yes, point? Maybe, um, maybe. I do understand what you're saying, Your Honor. Okay. Um, I believe it's Sparks, and it may be Sparks citing to Lichtenberger, discusses the fact that once um, a container or an individual file has been frustrated, the, um, the government can get further detail from that file. Well, that, that's the um, question I have. You know, if, if, if the, it's not so much the information um, gleaned from the file is, is uh, excluded, but the scope of the search, which included the file, right? And then, then the officer theoretically could look at the file and glean whatever information is there because that file has been within the, the search by the private individual. Exactly, Your Honor. The but scope can't is look that file. and glean information from additional files. Yes, Your Honor, exactly. So as long as that information was part of the file that was frustrated, that is within the scope of that private citizen search. Okay, you are into your rebuttal time, Ms. Sims. You can do with your minutes what you want. I'll um, wait and respond on rebuttal. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Mr. Muller? Good morning. Can you hear me? Can hear you fine. Uh, may it please the court. Uh, Dan Muller on behalf of Appley James Peterson. Uh, Your Honors, the trial court correctly granted the motion to suppress here. Uh, I'm going to be discussing three issues. Uh, first, it's that the state waived its independent source argument. Second, this court can affirm on the tipsy coachman basis that the police trespassed upon Mr. Pe Mr. Peterson's cell phone under United States v. Jones. And third, uh, the private search doctrine does not save this warrantless search. So before I get to the private search doctrine, I, I first quickly want to remind the court that the state uh, waived its independent source argument um, and you know, by not raising it below. In the trial court, they only raised consent and the private search doctrine. Uh, I also quickly wanted to address that this court can affirm on the tipsy coachman basis that the police trespassed upon Mr. Peterson's cell phone. So you have the cat's definition for a Fourth Amendment search, which involves a violation of an expectation of privacy. Uh, we know that the private search doctrine is concerned only with that definition. But then in 2012, in United States v. Jones, Justice Scalia reminds everyone that there's an additional definition for a Fourth Amendment search. That is a trespass of physical intrusion by the government seeking information. So we know that the private search doctrine is concerned with expectations of privacy whereas the trespass definition is not. So when the state says in its reply brief that the private search doctrine somehow authorized this trespass, that tells me that the state is not aware of the distinction between the two definitions. Uh, and the state filed a notice of supplemental authority last night, uh, a non-controlling case, and opposing counsel informed me that uh, she did not anticipate bringing up the case today I won't address it uh, except to say that the exact conclusion made by that court uh, is cogently refuted by the article we cited in our brief titled The Private Search Doctrine After Jones by Andrew McKee Mason uh, in the Yale Law Journal. Now, let's talk about the private search doctrine. There's a lot to unpack here. Uh, so we believe the two seminal cases here, Walter and Jacobson, are not so simple as to allow police to automatically review anything a private searcher has. In the background of all this is the default rule that prevents the warrantless search of closed containers. Even if police have probable cause to believe that a con closed container contains uh, uh, contraband or evidence of a crime, they cannot search it. They can seize it, but they cannot search it without a warrant. Now, there's certain exceptions that apply, uh, search incident to arrest, for example, automob automobile exception, uh, but no, no exceptions that the state is uh, contending apply here, none of the traditional exceptions. What the state well, is the contending- the cell phone was in the police custody, right? So it wasn't going anywhere. Correct. And, yeah, and there was no threat to the officers right? yeah. from the cell phone. Yeah. 
So, so what the state you, is can would you assert that the officer once once the victim here came and told the officer what she had discovered on the phone and described it would that have been sufficient for the officer to obtain a warrant? Uh, yeah, we we think that's correct, Your Honor. Uh, the, it it certainly uh, amounted to probable cause. Um, but whether they could, but it's not inevitable discovery because they weren't in the process, right? Um, correct. Okay. A and it wasn't, you know, and the state, like I said, waived its independent source argument. Um, so the court doesn't have a lot to go on here. Uh, there's two cases, Walter and Jacobson from the U.S. Supreme Court from the 1980s, both authored by Justice Stevens. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has not spoken on this issue since then. This court has never applied those cases in the nearly 40 years that they've uh, been out. Uh, the Florida Supreme Court has never applied those cases. And we know well, this but, court... I understand that they're all, but what's that otherwise got to do with anything? They're still out there. Yes, Your Honor. I, I, I'll explain why this court has not wanted to touch those cases with a 10-foot pole. Um, so, it, and, and just to say that this court is also not bound by the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals decisions uh, like sparks uh, that the state ha has raised uh, because uh, you're not bound even on federal issues by those uh, circuit court of appeal cases. So under Jacobson, we believe that the deputy exceeded the scope of the private search and she violated Justice Stevens' virtual certainty requirement in Jacobson. So there's the scope test in Jacobson, right? The additional invasions of privacy by the government agent must be de tested by the degree to which they exceeded the scope of the private search. So the idea is that the defendant loses his expectation of privacy in whatever is within the scope of the private search. Now the state and the cases upon which the well, state- Well, how, 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 how was the scope exceeded? Can you explain that? Yes, Your Honor. So we think that uh, Justice Stevens believes uh, one doesn't simply lose their expectation of privacy in what a private searcher sees. He believes that they lose their expectation of privacy only in the information the private searcher communicates to authorities about what she has found. So the scope of the private search is the results of the private search, but only in the form of the details the private searcher has okay, revealed so, to authorities. So, so the position here is what, what was that scope? And yes, then what was exceeded? So the scope would be uh, whatever the ex-wife explained to the deputy was in those images and videos before the deputy went ahead and actually looked at them. So we know here that uh, uh, there are plenty of things about these images and videos that the ex-wife did not describe uh, to the deputy. For example, did she describe whether or not Mr. Peterson is shown wearing a watch in these images and videos? Uh, or whether the watch was gold uh, or silver or plastic, or whether he so didn't have a watch so at all. So you're limiting. So you're limiting it to just the um, information that was communicated, as opposed to the containers or the actual full length of the of the videos or the pictures. That's, that's correct, Your Honor. The police can use that information uh, that the ex-wife uh, described to them. Uh, they could put the details into an application for a search warrant. They can uh, use that information to gather more evidence, like by confronting Mr. Peterson with it. Uh, but what they cannot do is, is access a closed container until they are virtually certain of all the contents of that container. So, you know, the state uh, has this expansive reading of Jacobson uh, that, you know, police can automatically review whatever a private searcher has. And uh, that's, that rests on the, the idea that uh, the defendant loses his expectation of privacy in anything the private searcher sees. But we think that that is too expansive. It's an absurd, uh, it, it would lead to uh, absurd results. Um, so for example, if it were true that you lose your expectation of privacy in anything a private searcher sees, that means if uh, any anytime two people share the same space, they would each defeat each other's expectations of privacy in that space. So if you invite someone into your home or your office or your car, and their eyes are open, they defeat your expectation of privacy in that space. That means the police can come in, look around. Uh, be, they don't need probable cause. They don't need a warrant uh, because uh, your expectation of privacy has been defeated. 
And so obviously we think this this is an absurd result. And you see well, that- Well, Mr. Miller isn't, I mean, this is a little different. We have a victim of a crime reviewing videos of her being sexually assaulted. I mean, the scenario that you're talking about, I haven't heard about any crime being committed in that open space. My guess is if there was, that person would be able to go to law enforcement and explain what happened. Are you saying that that would, information would be excluded? Well, what we're talking about here is that the state's reading of Jacobson rests on the theory that uh, the defendant loses his expectation of privacy in anything someone sees. And, and uh, we see that courts have struggled uh, to but, but, apply. But again, I guess, it's, I, don't, I don't know if you've quite answered my question, but if, if a crime was committed in that person in your open space that you're talking about, are you saying they wouldn't be able to go to law enforcement under, un, under the case law and, and explain what happened? No, no, certainly they can go and explain what happened and whatever information they reveal, police can use. But we're talking about accessing a closed container. So- um, That a private individual accessed. Correct. So- but We're talking it, about a container that was apparently never closed to her, correct? Well, it, it was closed- She had and, access to this phone, she used it frequently he handed it to her to use the, that's, and, and that's, in this I mean, case yes. he handed it to her and she found it after he handed it to her that's correct i mean i mean she could she could without permission access the contents of the phone so what was his reasonable expectation in terms of her ability to consent to someone looking in the phone so the 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 the, the, the cases in the private search doctrine aren't so much concerned with whether the victim of the private search consents or oh, not. I understand that. I'm talking about the, the police search of the phone and her ability to consent to that. Oh, well, the, 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 the deputy uh, knew that uh, it was Mr. Peterson's cell phone. and it, that, it, that, that he owned the phone. Correct, and that they did not ha have permission. That, 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 that they didn't have permission from him. Correct. But did the deputy, did the, did, did the evidence reflect how the, the, the victim explained to the deputy how she found the image, images or the videos? Uh, the, it's vague, but Your Honor, the, the state isn't raising the consent uh, as, a, as an exception. Um, so let me quickly uh, get to the, the virtual certainty requirement in Jacobson. Uh, and that is Justice Bel uh, Stevens believes that law enforcement uh, must have a virtual certainty of the contents of a container before they can access it, before they can search it. We know that the deputy here violated the virtual certainty requirement because there just, it would have been impossible for the ex-wife to explain all the privacies that were inherent in those images and videos uh, before the deputy went ahead and looked at them. Now I explained, you know, about, you know, Mr. Peterson's watch. Uh, did the ex-wife tell the deputy what color sheets uh, Mr. Peterson had at his home or uh, the color of his skin perhaps, or the color of the toy he used? These privacies may not have evidentiary value, but the Fourth Amendment doesn't just protect privacies that have evidentiary value, it protects all privacies. Uh, because so, uh, Mr. Mueller, uh, what you're what you're describing then then is the only information the ex-wife would have been able to provide was just words. She the videos would never. Is that is that what you're saying? Well, Not even the parts of the video that she described, or I because I'm I'm I, I want to understand. Oh. I want to make sure I understand your argument. So, Is it so, that she's allowed to relay what she saw, or can she? Can the videos themselves that she described be part of that private search? So the the issue here is whether police can go ahead and access a closed container. She can certainly relay whatever information she wants. She could also hand things over in plain view. Uh, nothing was handed over in plain view here. 
the cell phone's uh, content, the cell phone had to be manip manipulated to reveal its contents. The state is not asserting that the wife handed anything over in plain view. But uh, so the issue is, could poli the, the deputy search the contents of this phone? Um, and the virtual cer certainty requirement uh, says that uh, police must be virtually certain of all the contents of a container before they can access the contents. Um, I wanna talk about where that requirement comes from because it really gives context to Jacobson uh, and, and helps to understand what Justice Stevens is getting at with his virtual certainty requirement. He focuses uh, on the knowledge of the officers in Jacobson uh, uh, before their search. And he uses the term virtual certainty or virtually certain a couple of times. And he first used that term of art one year earlier in a case called Texas v. Brown. And in that case, he explains the default rule preventing warrantless searches of closed containers. But he says there's an exception that exists. And that is if police are virtually certain of all the contents of the container, either because of the outward appearance of the container uh, you know, an unopened beer can would be an example, or because of other context clues. Uh, if police know everything that is inside the container already, then the contents are tantamount to being in plain view, and therefore uh, the, there's no reason police can't override this default rule and so, so take a look. Applying at that test, so, so applying that test in the case of a container containing uh, baggies of drugs, for instance. Mm -hmm. If the officer didn't know ahead of time that the baggies were clear, or didn't know ahead of time how many of these baggies there were, the officer could not, would not be virtually certain of the contents of the box. That's what you're saying. That, well, you, in uh, Jacobson, the the court found that the uh, the FBI agents, the DEA agents in that case, were virtually certain of everything that was in the container. Um, like including the fact that the, the baggies were clear. Yes, Your Honor. And, and but, the baggies. So, so, if they, so if the, like an informant didn't say these were, there's a, there are 25 clear baggies of something that appears to be uh, cocaine in this box, you know, all, all the, all the officers know is there's cocaine in the box, they can't look in that box. Well, the, the question, right, is, are there any privacies remaining that are protected by the Fourth Amendment? And it's possible that a court might view uh, additional baggies as private information. But the, the single purpose container doctrine is, is basically what this is called. Uh, police can review the contents of a container if they're certain of everything that's inside. Uh, it does, the container doesn't necessarily have to have a single purpose. The idea is the authorities know everything that's inside already. So this, put, this puts Jacobson in context uh, because Justice Stevens is merely saying that a private searcher, uh, when, they, when they discuss what they found, they can simply help get the authorities closer to that virtual certainty threshold where they can then invade the contents of a closed container because they're tantamount to being in plain view at that point. But, you know, it's, Jacobson isn't some huge new doctrine that gives police expansive power to search anything uh, anytime someone else has. Uh, and, and in our case, you know, the deputy the ex-wife could not possibly made, have made the deputy aware of every privacy inherent in these images and videos. Uh, th there's the expression that a picture so, is So you're saying bottom line is when she comes to the, the officer and says, there's a, in this phone, there's a video of my ex-husband penetrating me with a dildo while I was asleep. The officer, because she didn't tell him what color the dildo was and what color his watch was or what color the sheets were, was not authorized to look at the video in the phone? That's correct, Your Honor. Those privacies, additional privacies, the color of the sheets- no, Couldn't look at it at all. Could not look at it at all. Correct. 
uh, uh, the contents of a, a closed container cannot be searched until uh, deputy, the deputy was virtually certain of all its contents. And those, those additional privacies may not have evidentiary value, you know. But there's, whether... a, but that, there's an infinite number of details. You know, was there a picture? Was there a picture on the wall in the video? What was in the picture? When was that picture taken? Well, I, I think this gets to. Was there a magazine on the night nightstand? What what uh, magazine was it? What was the issue? Ex exactly, Your Honor. The the Walter and Jacobson involved the binary question of whether or not contraband was present. Uh, th this involves dynamic evidence of alleged crime in the form of images and videos. There's the notion that a picture is worth a thousand words. The ex-wife couldn't speak a thousand words to describe these images and videos. And I think what one thing you're you're concerned about is, do do the authorities need absolute certainty? No, of you're, everything? you're talking about not even absolute. You're talking about unless they know every single item of information that they could glean from this video, they can't look. And we That's don't correct. know what every single item there is because, you know, as I say. You know, was the picture on the on the nightstand of uh, in uh, in a gold frame or a silver frame? Was it black and white or color? You're saying the, the absence of that prior knowledge prevents the detective from looking at that video in that phone altogether. That's exactly correct, Your Honor. These are you know privacies protected by the Fourth Amendment. It doesn't matter if they don't have evidentiary value. Mr. Peterson did not lose his expectation of privacy in those details until uh, the deputy uh, stumbled upon them. You uh, are, uh, at a, you're at you're 20 minutes there, Mr. Muller, okay. so you need to wrap up. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, so we would just ask that Your Honor study Jacobson uh, to the fullest extent possible and not give it a superficial reading uh, as some other courts have fallen prey to. Uh, I would just remind the court that no matter what it thinks of the state's private search doctrine argument, uh, this court can affirm on the tipsy coachman basis that police trespassed upon Mr. Peterson's cell phone. And if there are no other questions, uh, we ask that you affirm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Muller. Mr. S uh, Ms. Sims, you're, you have five minutes. Yes, Your Honor. Um, I just wanna go in order of how the defense approached these issues. Um, as to Jones and the applicability of Jones and negating um, Jacobson, Jones does reinvigorate the trespass approach. However, the fact remains that Jacobson held that a search didn't occur in this case. Um, our facts are on all fours with Jacobson when you update our facts, um, or you update Jacobson for new technology for electronic devices as Lichtenberger, Sparks, Terrell, um, and all the other cases that have applied this private search doctrine to electronics. Um, our facts are on all fours with Jacobson when it comes to that. There was a private search, the, um, expectation of privacy was frustrated, there was a replication search. Um, so matter, no matter how this case would be resolved under a trespass approach, the four Supreme Courts made, or the U.S. Supreme Courts made clear that um, if precedent of the court has direct application in a case, and then there appears to be um, other things rejected in another line of cases, this court should follow the case that directly controls. In this case, Jacobson directly controls. Um, and because it directly controls, this court should follow Jacobson's legal rule in deciding this issue. Um, as to virtual certainty, while of course this court's not bound by the federal cases, this court can look to them for guidance. This court can look to those cases to see that this doctrine has been applied to cell phones, has been applied to electronic devices. And what it's done is it has defined the search of the scope. It has defined virtual certainty. Um, and additionally, this court did address the private search doctrine, not by name, but by application in Duke, um, as argued in the initial brief. So this is not a foreign thing for this court to address. Um, but in every case that's discussed as private search doctrine, the scope is the container. Um, the scope is not the details within a photo. The scope is not the details within a video. It's the container, that um, single purpose container doctrine as defense counsel argued. Um, no cases have limited the search to simply description of the items. If so, then no other case would be able to have pictures and videos as it does. Um, the defense also discussed the idea that someone in someone else's space doesn't frustrate that expectation of privacy, that that, that does not give the court a reason or the government a reason to do a confirmatory search. But arguably, if 
I was in someone's car and opened a box within their car, a closed container, and I found an album, a closed album containing child pornography. Arguably, I have frustrated that expectation of privacy and then a confirmatory search could occur if I brought that to law enforcement's attention. They could go through that closed container that I found in that person's space and they could confirm those pictures and videos or those pictures in the album so long as I already looked at them. I frustrated that expectation of privacy and I turned that over for confirmatory search. So there, the argument is to be made that that's where this private search doctrine comes in. When one person breaches another's expectation of privacy, reasonable expectation of privacy, it's frustrated, it no longer exists, and the government can confirm that search. Um, there are cases that have discussed this. This court should look to those cases for guidance. The scope in this case was not exceeded. The officers looked only at the pictures and videos that the victim looked at. They both confirmed that at the evidentiary hearing. Both parties confirmed that these were the only pictures and videos looked at. The scope was not exceeded. Um, the best analogous case for ours is Sparks, looking at the first holding of the court that the pictures and videos that were frustrated were permissible um, and were to be admitted at trial and the state would rely on its briefs for the remainder of the arguments if this court has no further questions we would ask this court to reverse the suppression of the pictures and videos okay thank you both very much thank you um in order to leave this virtual space you need to press or click the leave button in the lower right hand corner of your zoom frame or whatever